about the future of real estate and how EXP is going to stay ahead of the puck, like Wayne Gretzky. Yes. Well, I would say that, you know, especially since taking over the, the mantle, you know, when I speak to Wall Street and I speak to investment bankers, you know, everyone wants to know what my immediate focus is on. And I would say that it's been singular focus on maneuvering the NAR settlement. Uh, as you guys know, I was probably one of the loudest executives in the industry to not be scared to have very direct conversations. I'm spending a decent amount of time, my, my time speaking to the media as well, uh, since other companies aren't uh, w- interested in, 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 in having the conversations because the liability it entails. So, you know, I'll, I'll kind of summarize a lot of the thoughts on my mind about it. Uh, the settlement got pushed from mid July to now August 17th. Mm. The punchline is that. The world as we knew it from cooperation uh, being offered on the MLS is being deleted. So, you know, I've been licensed 23 years. Um, Buyer agency, and again, state by state. So some people on this call could have different rules in their market. But for the most part, we operated under what is was referred to as implied representation. And we were really protected under procuring costs, right? So um, if you think about it, it was it was a very informal relationship, right? You bumped into somebody, whether it was at the open house or in some other form, and you were kind of like, "Hey, let me just go open this door for you. Let's then we can kind of talk about it, see if we have chemistry." And and a lot of times, even if it came up, it's like, "Oh, don't worry about it. You don't have to pay me out of pocket," right? Mm-hmm. And it was not formalized. If you compare that experience or that transaction to a listing, they're for the most part, on average, again, there's always outliers, diametrically different, right? If I were to tell you guys, go take a listing, kind of maybe, sort of, and don't get a listing agreement signed, you guys would be like, what? You bumped your head. Like, that's not even possible, right? Mostly because the MLSs won't allow it, right? You can't stick a listing in the listing into the MLS unless you have an executed listing agreement, whether it's exclusive or open, but some form of documentation with a start date, an expiration date, what you were offering, all that stuff. If you change the price, you needed an amendment, right? If you think about it, it was very specific. And the concept to us of taking a listing with no specific compensation would be crazy, right? It's like, I'm not going to stick a sign on the ground on a lockbox, spend money on photos, do drone video. Like, absolutely not, right? Like, all of us have the option to take an open listing on the MLS, right? Mm-hmm. If we remember that from principles class, and we we said, I'm not I'm not doing that because that's crazy. I don't know if I'm going to get paid or not. If I'm going to invest thousands of dollars to get bring this property to market, I want to know I'm the one getting paid. Now, when I say it out loud, it seems super logical, but that's basically we were doing the polar opposite on, on buyer agency. So the 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 big things to note that the world changes dramatically on August 17th is if you do not have a buyer agreement signed prior to unlocking the door. And again, I'm just telling you what the, the settlement says, you're not able to earn a commission. Again, it has not been rolled out. And the one thing we keep saying on these calls and to the media is, we don't know what we don't know. So we are all equally unprepared for when it starts in the sense of no one has an unfair advantage of having done this before. But what is interesting to me is each state's going to have different enforceability. Right, so some some of the conversation is the MLSs are the enforcing body, and what what the penalty is going to be. So, and I and I always like to remind people that real estate is local. In the state of Virginia, if you practice real estate without a license, the penalty is up to a thousand dollar fine. If you do the same thing across the river in Maryland, the penalty is up to one year in jail. Hmm. Same same infraction, very different outcomes. So. Those are the one things I always like to remind people that real estate rules will be hyper local. So, the, the the things that you need to remember is the one sentence I actually had a t shirt and I was rocking it yesterday for calls like this that says, treat your buyers like you treat your sellers. Everything you do for a seller, checklist wise, presentation wise, build that for buyers. So, I, I have actionable instructions for you, which is call every buyer you put into a home for the last 24 months and interview them about what they liked about your service. You need to start getting those sound bites. You need to understand the value you delivered. And oh, by the way, 
if they loved it and they're raving fans, ask them to give you a review on the internet, Google, Zillow, wherever you like to keep reviews, explaining your prowess as a buyer's agent in that market. Right? Like if I called on any one of you and I might just do it for fun here, I got your names and said, you know, what's your average days on market? What's your list to price list to sales price ratio? What percentage market share do you have a subdivision? Like I know Tom knows those numbers because he and I used to compete for number one. He couldn't he couldn't take the number one spot until I decided to retire out of selling. But we yeah. used to compete and share those numbers, right? None of us know that on the buy side. And me neither, because no one ever put me to that test, right? Like, can you guys tell me what percentage of transactions in the last 24 months you were able to negotiate concessions and how much, right? Like how how great of a stat is it? You guys, and again, statistically speaking, you guys can say in the last 12 months, I was able to negotiate concessions 55% of the time. The reason I can say that is because that's what CRMLS says and that's what Bright MLS says. Hmm. So if you had to if you had to go blind today to a buyer's appointment, you can actually say that. I would encourage you to go back and double check your personal one because you could be higher. You could be at 60 or 70%. But like, imagine there's a stat that's real for one of you that says, in the last 12 months, I've negotiated 4% concessions off list 70% of the time. And oh, by the way, my fee is 2.5%. Like, all of a sudden, it's like, oh my God, this is a deal, right? This is this value I'm receiving in exchange for the service rendered is, 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 is powerful. So how many times have you won in a multiple contract situation, right? How many homes do you show on average to get somebody under contract? These are all the numbers that are going to be very, very real, right? Because you're going to be able to need to defend your fee and your service. Because I, I firmly believe that people will still choose representation at a disproportionate rate. And again, I'm, I don't, I'm not saying that because I'm emotional. I'm saying that because that's what the data says on the seller side. Sellers have had the option to not use this for decades. Think about it. All the eyeballs go to Zillow, all of them. Sellers today can go list for sale by owner on Zillow and not pay a listing agent or a buyer's agent where all the eyeballs are. Zillow puts out a seller report every year, and their last most updated one, I think, is 22 numbers for 2023. It said that 36% of sellers in the United States try FISBO before they even go on the market with an agent, and only 11% execute. Mm -hmm. So more than two-thirds of them say this shit is hard and hire a professional, right? Meaning 89% of the net sellers, according to the Zillow data set, use an agent. And on the listing side, you've had the most choice, right? Full service, flat fee, a la carte, like $499 on the MLS, $150 bucks for a lockbox. Like all those companies have existed for decades, right? So my bet is there is going to be a percentage of the population who are going to say, okay, I, don't, I want to save myself the fee. And they're going to try it. And they're going to call 15 different listing agents, not get callbacks, try to coordinate open houses because they don't have a lockbox key. Maybe get into an open house and go, I love it. Okay, send me an offer. They're like, well, how do I do that? Go hire a lawyer. Go, do you know what I mean? There's so many things that we take for granted because we do it as professionals that I think there's going to be kind of a rude awakening of what value we deliver. The other super tactical, actionable thing I'll tell you all to do is Google the 101 things that you do as a buyer's agent. And I already put that list together. It's really solid. And have that as part of your buyer presentation. Like, hmm. this is what I do for my feet. Right. Um, and actually have it as part of your listing presentation, guys. Because what's going to happen now is this is the script, the exact script I would use post August 17th, and it needs to be factual. Before August 17th, this is how the world worked. Right. I used to take a X percent commission, split it evenly. Whatever you used to do, just make sure it's factual. Post August 17th, this is how the world works. This is the fee you owe me for the services I'm willing to provide. Right. You'll pay me X and I will do Y. Sign in the ground lockbox, drone video. If there is a buyer, there could be an ask for buyer compensation of X. It's up to you if you want to pay it or not. It's negotiable, just like the price, the closing date, and everything else. I would, I would set the expectation of explaining how the process works. And if you choose not to do that, 
then you know if they're they're competing for multiple properties it could be a different outcome and also explain oh by the way there is now a scenario where someone could say i'm unrepresented and i don't want to use an agent i want to buy your house and then i would explain to them be like and by the way we're updating the listing agreement so this this will be there where you have a it's called either dual track commission structure or variable commission structure depending on the state you're in where i will charge you x for the listing services but if an unrepresented buyer wants me to do ministerial acts and fill out the contract presented to you here's the 101 things that that's different services rendered than the listing side what are you going to pay me for that behavior right because it's different if i'm supposed to staff your house to show it 24 7 because that's part of the buyer co-op to unlock that door so you have to be as well versed and skilled in this as a mm -hmm. listing agent as 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 you would have to be to negotiate with a buyer representation because you have to educate the seller so leo you know, listings that I've always said, when there's an absence of value, there's a questioning of price, right? So that's basically the mindset that we need to have with our buyers is we need to, if I'm hearing you say very clearly that we need to be able to know our value and be able to communicate very, very well what that is. And then you should be 100%. able to lock down your compensation. So, And again, and, and, I'm, and I'm very clearly not saying what it should be. Right, because when I was an listing agent, there were there were clients I actually did a flat fee for because they were institutional and their homes were fully repaired, and I didn't have to physically go into them, and they were staged. But then there was Harry homeowners who I I managed renovations, got the multiple contract, and you know I charge them more than six percent sometimes because I was more of a GC general manager, like did the staging, took care of everything, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, like one thing that I think will happen out of this is that different levels of sophistication of consumers will probably require different pricing. Mm -hmm. Like if I bought a house um, from any one of you in a resort market, I'm very different as a consumer than a first time home buyer who needs to do, uh, you know, a down payment assistance program and everything else, right? It's, it's a very different conversation than someone who's an institutional buyer, right? Like I'm, rep I'm negotiating two and 3,000 listings at a time for revenues, which by the way, I'm going on listing appointments for you guys, no different than you where I have a presentation and you are my 90,000 person team that I'm I'm bidding for. But like they're institutional. So they're like, hey, I'll pay you one and a quarter on the listing side, but you know, you're getting 10 listings at a time and they're professional and they're going to lower the price every two weeks. It's going to behave more like REO in the sense of like, Here's our execution number. You're being graded on it. However close you are to, you know, uh, net execution, you'll get more business. So you'll you you would do that typically, probably for lower than someone else who's going to have you hold their hand and you're going to pick out all the colors and you're going to do all the different stuff and it's one transaction. So yeah, I think all of us treat different opportunities differently today. It's just you just have to put on that agent hat. That's why my t-shirt says, treat your buyers like you treat yourself. So Leo, switching gears a little bit, uh, Coach Randy Bird put in the chat, uh, what are you most excited about? I'm, I mean, you're like leading the charge here. So what are you most excited about that you, you know, obviously can discuss? I know there's things you're working on that you can't discuss, but, you know, about the future of EXP and some of our, you know, greatest future opportunities. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I define... EXP consistently the same way, which is one is I view us as a platform to allow real estate entrepreneurs to build whatever size dream they want. And so I very much think of us as an operating system, which means a couple of things to me. One is that you guys are the personal branch. I have no confusions about it. The EXP is, is secondary to you guys because you are the local experts, the local ambassadors. You know, when I look at products and services I'm obsessed with as a consumer, the, the, the commonality is a frictionless experience, right? Like I go out of my way not to give Amazon money every day. Like I'm remodeling some bathrooms right now and I will drive my ass to Home Depot and Ace and begrudgingly order the part on Amazon. And it arrives like yesterday as I was giving the kids a shower, uh, we needed a shampoo we ordered and it was here before I left the house at 6 a.m. Like 8 p.m. 
it arrived at sick. That's as frictionless as possible. And I, I saw a uh, talk Jeff Bezos gave, and he said, like, when you look at a business 10 years out, are there constants, right? Like people always want their stuff as fast as possible for the best price, right? So for us, it's like, okay, how do I pay you as fast as possible? And you'll see that in in how we pay commissions over the last two years, how much we've sped that up to even the pay now button in RevShare, right? Like to me, it's like, okay, how do I know that no matter what, you guys will be happy. Let me pay you as fast as legally and humanly possible with commissions in RevShare. Those are like, that is my number one thing I can do as a broker. Yeah. And then how do I make almost every other experience as frictionless as possible? So what does that mean? If you call agent support 24, first of all, now it's 24 seven, we follow the sun. Uh, and we've made it so that the talk track to whoever picks up the phone is empowered to close the loop for you, right? Like mm. the other theory I obsess with is we're a sample size of one, right? So like if I like something or I hate something, I just assume there's a large number of people who feel the same way. Like I hate being transferred and talking to robots. So like, let's make sure we don't do that, right? Uh, and I invite you guys to look at your business the same way. Like what, what things do you love the most about it? Like I like Apple. I'm talking to you on my laptop. My iPhone's right here. My watch is there. My AirPods are there. The wallet's there. It's not because I'm a Steve Jobs fanboy. It's because they create an ecosystem that's frictionless, right? Like I can hit a download button. Um, July 15th, we're doing a new release to my EXP that we've been in beta with a bunch of people. Super excited. Like how do we make it as simple as possible? But remembering what we're here to do, we're here to power your business and make it as frictionless as possible, as simple as possible. I love it. So um, tell me, why do top agents choose eXp Realty? Yeah. And again, th it, that answer, I think, depends on the personality. So th the one thing I've heard, Glenn, and I just spent like almost a month with him on the road, uh, he, he said, like, we didn't build this for everyone. Like, we are not a perfect fit for everybody. Right now, we sit at like 4.2% of every agent in the US. Um, and we don't have to be all things to all people. I think for the entrepreneurial real estate agent, we are the best platform, right? In the sense of we're competitive on economics. Um, I came from the KW world like, like some of you did. And the typical path is you go from an agent to a team leader, to a mega team leader, to buying an office. I bet Tom and you know, Don had the exact same progression as I did or I had the same progression as he. Um, and the economics just aren't that interesting. Like if you so choose to do that with us, it is an order of magnitude more interesting, right? Like some of the most uh, successful attractors that you probably hadn't heard of, right? Not the, the Brent Goves or the Gene Fredericks. I'm talking about the people that make 20 to 25K a month are former team leaders who took their same behavior where it's like, I'm going to prospect two hours a day. I'm going to have five interviews a day and I'm going to add one person a week. And they treat it just like a business. The difference is that 25K or 30K a month has minimal expenses attached to it. They didn't sign a 10 year lease, they didn't sign the 10 year franchise yeah. agreement. They don't have an MCA, a team leader, and a broker. Like, if you compare the ROI opportunity, and where the flywheel effect that is now EXP is that we're fully scaled, we're sustainable. So right now we're experiencing, you know, 23 bootleg competitors, which I'm done, I'm done with the flattery portion of uh, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. But no one has shown me mathematically that any of those companies will be here in five or 10 years because they're not sustainable in their core business, right? If, if you lose a thousand dollars a transaction and you're growing rap rapidly, that's not going to end well. Right. And if the promise is someday maybe we're going to build this thing that's unproven, that's also a scary place to build your foundation to a business. Because if you choose to attract and build on a MLM platform, which is what we have and most of our competitors have, you are hoping that it's going to be there five years from now. Right. That's the big distinction. Um, I don't know if any of you watched it. I would invite you to watch my uh, conversation I had with Brian Carruthers. Um, he's probably one of the most, he wrote um, Untrapped and Building an Empire. Uh, and he joined uh, his um, MLM business when they were in year 25. Mm -hmm. So not ground floor. And he's been with them for 25 years. They're like in year 52. They were 
private public got taken private by private equity again. And he actually, you know, talks to MLM practitioners across the globe, across industry. And he's like, that's actually one of the things I look for that they've made it into their second decade and that they're public and that they have cash on the books. And like, you can adjust to market conditions and make pivots, but like, he says the most overused pitch he hears is ground floor that they, they call him and say, Hey, if you did that with pre, you know, legal shield, imagine what you could do with us here. And it's like, I don't know that that company is going to be there. So when you choose to build and have uh, that investment in, in, in yourself and your time and like, you know, the folks who built franchises, uh, you, you're hoping that that's going to be there in the future. And that's a pretty big gamble that you're taking if, if the company doesn't succeed. Right. So that's, that's just an interesting then aside there. I'm grabbing the links and somebody asked for it real quick. Uh, give me a second if you want to. Yeah, while you're while, while you're doing while that, yeah. I just posted the YouTube link in the chat for everybody for the mm -hmm. interview that you recommended. Thank you, Stephanie. Hey, um, Leo, here's a question. It's hard to identify or quantify collaboration. I know when I'm talking to other agents, and you know, it's super collaborative at EXP. But how do you really communicate that well to another agent other than stories or what have you? I'm curious. Yeah, so it's, no, no, that's a great question uh, that I'm trying to solve. So I will, I will, I will tell you uh, uh, anecdotally something that I'm like hyper aware and I can verbalize to people. Like a lot of the things that our competitors are saying about us, I'm actually saying I it was a feature, not a bug, and it was designed that way. Right. So KW was the first one to revolutionize the industry with profit share. They grew quickly. I feel that Glenn Sanford improved upon a lot of their stuff, right? By first of all, making rev share top line 50 50, 50%, 50%. It's very transparent and predictable. Um, and, and really, what EXP gave rise was to true collaboration because people were collaborating from all over the country. Because in the franchise world, you're kind of stuck to your region and the people you have proximity to. Um, and, and Glenn, very different than KW, Remax, and the other ones where we're very personality-driven. It was like Dave Linnunger, Gary Keller, this is the way you mm -hmm. come and read my, my books and I tell you how to live your life. Mm -hmm. Glenn said, actually, I think there's a ton of talented human beings who all have a lot to give. And you grow your own bottoms-up infrastructure. And that's actually what we did. And we became the fastest-growing real estate company in the history of real estate. Um, we're now much bigger and we're, we haven't done, and you'll probably see me more actively trying to do that is give talk down, top down talk tracks or communication, not telling you how to do the business, but articulating things like me explaining to you what we are. We are a platform that allows real estate entrepreneurs to grow whatever size business you want. That actually speaks to a Justin Haver that did 1100 transactions in Calgary last year, or to an agent that does 10 transactions a year. And is perfectly happy with that, right? It is the 86% of the agents that have zero people in their front line. And that actually tells me that we're a phenomenal real estate company mm. to be with and the choice for the vast majority of our agents. Or you could be the 14% that choose to build a different revenue stream. And that could be a million dollars a year, or it could be 1500 bucks a year or a month, right? Like the... Some of my favorite rev share stories is when someone messages me and said, Hey, I just paid my car payment with this. I just, this now covers my mortgage on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. In a in a way, that's actually more exciting to me than when someone's like, I make $50,000 a year and this is my business, right? I don't know why, but I get more excited for that story where it's like, I'm just going about my transactions. I have a good transaction with someone on the other end of that. And I introduce them to the concept and now they're happy here. And, you know, it's now covering some fixed expenses for me. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, Matthew, I'm, I'm actively trying to answer that question and give you guys the, the sound bites and the talk tracks. Like one thing that, uh, I just had a conversation with the engineering team and I normally don't talk about what's coming. I just turn it on one day, like pay now last month, mm -hmm. raise your hand if you like that one. Oh yeah. I'd been, I'd been working on that for 18 months, right? Like I looked at the roadmap and I said, Okay, let's prioritize paying people as fast as possible. So there was like two really big one. One is now you basically 
through uh, real-time payments through the FDIC. Like we can actually get your commission into your account almost the same day as your closing. Hmm. That was a very, very long project. And pay now was another one because there's just a lot of moving parts to get to, to balance the accounts and fund all that stuff. But one of the things that specifically to your question, Matthew, I'm working on is if I, I've pulled most of the attractors who create content and like 80% of them say, I'll share it with anybody in the company. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I'm working on a universal calendar, but I think for it to work well, we need some you know, really good UI UX, kind of like a Netflix ish where it's like categories, bios, experience levels. And so mm-hmm. you can actually search because right now where we have fields like Excel or like college you know, look up board in the nineties. And I very well recognize that. So just like those other projects where it's like, Hey, I got to deliver it in a consumable way. That's, that's, I don't know when I'll deliver it. I don't know what it'll look like, but that's where my head's at on that kind of stuff where it's like, if there's a URL you can click on and you can search by production level or category or personality or by, you know, pictures kind of like Netflix where it's like drama, this, that, and you can kind of go down that rabbit hole. I think that would be really cool. And it's agent created content. And like, what's a better demonstration of collaboration than that? Absolutely. That would be pretty epic, actually, because it's hard to quantify when you're talking to someone about collaboration. Um, you know, so to be able to go, hey, go here to this site or whatever, it's pretty mind blowing. Um, that that's an exciting thing. So tell me about some of the other exciting, uh, you know, one of your babies was EXP exclusives. That was something that you really, you know, uh, just went after and, and we've put together. Uh, maybe speak a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, and, and, that and I do have a, I, I have a stop, but I, I'll answer that one. Um, okay. So EXP exclusives, um, you know, so clear cooperation and compensation, it is really the crux of how we share data in the MLS world, which, which states that you have to put in a listing into the MLS by X amount of time. And just to be clear, this is very different than a coming soon. So one of the exceptions to sticking something in the MLS is intra-office marketing. So mm-hmm. most of us came from a franchise. The average franchise size in the country is probably, I don't know, 20 to 40 agents, right? Mm-hmm. With a couple outliers to a couple hundred. Um, but in most states, we're one office, right? California is the only where we're regionalized, but like Northern Cal is a very different market than Southern Cal. So it doesn't matter, right? So right now we have more inventory last week when I checked than Compass who've been at it for 10 years. Wow. So in most markets, we now have more unique inventory than any other company. And the other kind of very high level talk track that's top down that I want you all to internalize is we are the single largest brokerage on the planet as an independent company and as a transaction-based metric. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we sold 355,000 homes last year. That's 40% more than number two. Wow. That's 100% more than number four. It's 6X more than number six, right? And number three is, or number four is Compass and number six is real, right? Like orders of magnitude more productive than the other companies. Because one of the talk tracks about us is we're just the recruiting company. Well, no, we're the, I sell more homes than you company. We have the most productive agents in the country company, right? Our top 250 teams sold north of 69,000 homes. Mm -hmm. If they were a standalone independent company, they would be number six after Howard Hamlin with only our top 250 teams. So those are the conversations that I focus on and explain as much as possible. That's awesome. So you got a hard stop. We got to, we don't get more of you. I could probably go five more minutes. I'll send a text. Okay, cool. Appreciate it. You're awesome. Um, Let's see. Let me get a quick question here. Um, So Tell me about some of the uh, the real big movement as of late is Brian has been bringing on training and development and, you know, and we got the radio station now, like there's so much stuff, so many moving parts of value that EXP that I don't think the vast majority of our agents even know all the no. stuff that's being so, so put out there. Great. Yes, that's a great going to end on. So Brian Ellington is someone I recruited personally on October 2nd of last year, one yeah. day after his non-compete expired with Realogy. So if you don't know who Brian Ellington was, he was the chief uh, product officer and chief learning officer for Keller Williams for 15 years. He was the one who built maps. He then went on to Realogy, was the chief learning officer of Realogy and the chief operating officer for Century 21. And I'd said... You know, his his personal goal 
is to beat KW in number of recognitions of the best training company in the world. So yeah. that's his personal goal. Because I think he did it four times at Keller. He says, I need to do it five times at, at EXP. So we literally had our one-on-one earlier today. And my obsession is making sure that we have a good mix of free included content, mm-hmm. also premium agent celebrity like vetted content, right? So I, I do want to be the best place to start and you literally there's no hidden fees like so we're we're baiting a product called fast cap which is a six week ramp up yeah we started it yesterday in the beta and we had 463 people show up so i think there's demand uh we're gonna roll it out officially company-wide i think in september and then really make a push for it at exp con but i want to have as many value propositions that don't cost any more additional dollars to say hey if you just pass a test here's how we get you into production, right? Um, now, in addition to that, like we're partnering with agents who have legitimate content that's vetted. And one of the things that I want to do is back to like frictionless process. Like I will be getting real-time agnostic feedback in PS style, where if a course is overperforming, we tell you if it it's not performing, we would have a system to remove it from, from the roster. Uh, but again, I, I, there is there's kind of the meat and potatoes of like zero to one and then there's also the specializations of like hey investor focused or youtube long form focused or ai focused or any of that stuff so i I want the full suite but um i will tell you that's going to become one of the things we're known for over the next couple of years yeah it's awesome there's so much coming on so we want to respect your time really really appreciate you spending it with us and uh, thank you all for showing up um, and uh, really, you know, asking some great questions. Um, Leo, is there anything that you, you know, desire from us or that we could do for you? Yes. If you're in communications with someone who you feel uncomfortable or you don't feel prepared to have that level of value proposition, pull me in. I'm talking about like 50, 100 million in production to small to mid-size independents, I would I would be leveraging this moment where there's this much turmoil. So one of the predictions I'm making is after August 17th, there is going to be utter chaos, right? Mm-hmm. There are brokerages who are not obsessing over it like we are and creating the documentation and creating the forums and educating and being in the field about it. Like I have Kendall Bonner going on a full like virtual roadshow where we're like literally explaining the legalities of it, how to, how to word the Like even the differences of saying having the seller pay EXP a broker compensation of X, right? So it's compliant with the VA funding and the FHA. Like we're being super tactical about it. I know that come August 16th, the shit will hit the fan at other companies where people have had their head in the sand. Mm -hmm. And like I'm telling you right now, in September, I want you to remember this conversation when someone realizes they're making zero dollars at the closing table, (laughs) right? Because that listing no longer had a buyer co-op and they weren't paying attention to which listing they wrote a contract on and someone's going to lose their shit because they are, they're going to make no money at the, the closing table. And those are the opportunities to attract because we're calm. We're well-versed in it. We're ahead of the curve. But what I'm telling you is there's going to be a hundred. I don't know if you guys know, we onboarded a 500 person brokerage in Miami last month. No. 23, 21 year old independent family owned business. Wow. And she said, and I, I did a podcast, I interviewed her. I'm like, why? I yeah. want to know why. Yeah, why. So you guys know why. I don't want the liability anymore. Number one, I can't afford to compete with the tech platform that you can buy, right? Like what I can get you guys in Skyslope and KB Core and put it all together for $85 a month, people can't compete with, right? And I wanted EXP exclusives. And she said, I wanted a national and global platform, right? She was in Miami. She said, now my buyers are actually in Dubai, in London, in Madrid, in Lisbon. I needed a global platform to be able to sell real estate in the market I live in today. So I'm telling you right now, I'm actively conversating with an 1100 person brokerage, a 2000 person mm-hmm. brokerage, a five th- companies that six months ago would have never been on the phone with me are now open to the conversation. So my ask of you guys is think big. Swing for the fences. And if you got to yell Reco and get me on the phone, I'll, I'm there for you. 
I love it. And we didn't even get to go over EXP uh, luxury and farm and ranch and celebrity division. I mean, there's just so much going it's, on. It's, 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 that's going to have to be for another call. I, I, gotta, know, I, I know. I'm late for the other call. All right, brother. Thank you so much Thanks, for your Leo. time, Leo. We really, really appreciate it. This is our CEO, guys. It's taking time for our team meeting. That is awesome. All right. Thank take you. care, buddy. Thank you, Leo. Right. Bye. Thanks, guys. You all got your inspiration. Time to put into perspiration, right, Matt? That's right. That's right. Let's do it. Let's go get them. Okay, see y'all next week. We've got another exciting meeting next week. Every week, same bat time, same bat channel. Thanks, guys. See ya.